Awesome. If you've got a, a uh, Bible there, can you open up to uh, Matthew 14? Open up to Matthew 14 again. I'm just going to pray for it. Lord, I want to thank you for your word, God. I want to thank you for your presence. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is here in this place right now with everybody in this room that has bowed their knee to Jesus, everybody that has given their lives over to you, everybody that has accepted the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as having taken place for them, everybody who has repented and turned, God, we have a promise in your word that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you teach each person this morning? Would you speak to us? Would you guide us into all truth? And Father, I pray that when we walk out of this place here this morning, that God will go with a greater sense of intimacy and purpose and passion for you and for your word. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, here's the thing. Uh, last week, we started looking at Matthew chapter 14. See, I took my glasses off and I couldn't see where that was. So I took them off and I couldn't see and I put it on nothing. I need these glasses. I need these glasses. <laughs> Matthew 14, last week we started looking at the story of Peter getting out and walking on this liquidy substance that we call H2O. Uh, Jesus was there, there's a storm, uh, Jesus is not in the boat on this particular occasion, there's just been some uh, uh, miracles took place on the mainland, Jesus sends his disciples off, Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray, spends some time in prayer, comes down, his disciples are halfway across the sea, they're battling, uh, the wind's against them, and Jesus goes walking out on the sea, just a normal day I guess, he goes walking out on the sea towards the disciples, and uh, the disciples see him walking on the sea, and we pick up the story in Matthew uh, chapter 14, verse 24, it says that the boat was now in the middle of the sea, focused, uh, uh, tossed. By the way, so the wind was contrary. Now, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them. He said, Be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. I, I actually love that. The preacher on that was one. The minute Jesus heard them cry out with fear, the minute they were terrified, he speaks to them straight away to calm the fear. Straight away. Didn't wait for a period of time, didn't sit back and let them get all stressed. No, he was ready to speak to them straight away. As soon as they began to feel that fear building up, he said, Be a good cheer, it's all right, don't be afraid. And Peter, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you from all of you, you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat and walked on the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, said, You are you a good place, why? Did you doubt? Last week we started looking at this story, but the question that I'm trying to answer here, or the characteristics I'm looking at, is what does it actually take to walk on water? What kind of a person gets the opportunity to walk on water? What does it mean to walk on water in 2021 for each of us? And so, when I read this story, it redeems the person of Peter to me. Because I mean, you know, Peter is actually you know, a bit of a negative guy at times, he's the bullfed of the bunch. He's the guy that speaks about the thing. He's the guy that thinks he's bigger than Van Hurt, and he's actually not. There's a lot of things about Peter, a lot of illustrations we get from Peter's life that kind of paint Peter in the negative. But I don't actually think there's a lot of really great positives in this story uh, that we can take out about Peter. Last week, we talked about the characteristic number one of people who walk on water. They overcome the fear of men. They learn how to overcome the fear of man. Now, if you go on in Peter's story, it's interesting that later on, when Jesus is getting crucified, what does Peter do? He actually comes back under the fear of man. Three times, people come up to him and say, aren't you one of them? And he goes, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't know this dude. Another one comes up, I don't know this dude. Another one comes up, a little girl, and he freaks out and starts carrying on. And then a rooster crows. So, overcoming fear of man is not something that we just do in one moment and bang, it's gone. I feel like it's, it's something that, as all of these characteristics are, they're things that kind of come that we've got to keep going back to and assessing and looking at. And I wonder after last week, uh, how many of us walked away and in these last seven days, how many of us looked and examined our responses, our actions, our words, the different things that we did, and asked yourself the question, am I being dictated to by the fear of man here, or is this really me? Is this really what I believe, or is this the way the conversation is going? And in order to fit in, I'm just going to agree and say, yeah, that's right. Or, 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 or whatever it is that I'm doing. Am I looking at those things because I'm afraid to not look at it because people might think I'm a nutcase at work, so I'll just... What areas of our world are we still being bound and controlled by fear of man? Because Proverbs 29 makes it very clear, fear of man is a snake. 
The fear of man is not a good thing. The fear of man is designed to keep you back from doing what God wants you to do and keep you back from becoming what God wants you to become. And if you were to figure out what the pain fear of man here in the boat, he jumped out and he didn't care what the other 11 disciples thought. But he was sinking, he didn't really care what they thought. He cried out for help. There's a lot of good in the way that Peter overcame fear of man in that moment, but we know later on he didn't. So it's one of those things that's good to keep going back and keep revisiting in your life. In one environment you may overcome it. But then you might find out in here, it's still holding you back from being who you're meant to be and doing what you're meant to do. So fear of man is number one. What I want to look at this week is very, very, very simple. This will not be profound. Sometimes it's the most simple things in life to get by the Lord, isn't that right? It's the simplest things that are right in front of you that we want the deeper, the more profound things, and we miss sometimes the things that are right there. What I want to say to you today is very simple. Uh, Owen, uh, I rang Owen this morning, and I said to Owen and Judy, they were coming in, I said, could you guys grab some milk for our church this morning because we've got no milk in the fridge? And Owen said to me, yeah, I can. What, what, what type of milk do you want? Do you want almond milk? Do you want slow skin milk? Do you want fat free milk? Do you want fat full milk? What sort of milk do you want? And I instantly thought of the ad. You remember the ad years ago on TV? And I said to him, I just want milk that tastes like real milk. <laughs> Anyone remember that ad? It's just simple. I just want something simple this morning. Milk to put in my coffee. It's all I want. Don't overwhelm me. Don't make it too complicated. Well, this morning's message is really along the lines of, I just want something that tastes like real milk. It's nice and simple. Nice and simple. The second characteristic of people who walk on water, and it's not going to blow your mind, it's not going to shatter your world, but it can make a huge difference if you embrace this. But I wonder how far we've strayed from some of the simple things. And here it is, the second characteristic of people who walk on water, they have a high regard for the Word of God. They have a high regard for the Word of God. So they ask the question, what was it that got Peter out of the boat that particular day? What was it that got Peter to do something unnatural to his own makeup and mind, what got Peter to step out of the safety and comfort of having wooden boards under his feet to stepping out on something the last time he did it, he sank to the bottom. I'll guarantee last time Peter got out of the boat, didn't walk on the water, he would have had to swim to shore. But here he is all of a sudden doing something and getting out of the boat. What was it that got Peter out of the boat? It's not complicated. It wasn't because everybody else was doing it. I was I could go down to, to Lismore tomorrow and generation go. Tony missed in the past there, one of my best mates, and I love Tony. And I, I go down there and Tony's got his whole congregation. And they're all down there on the edge, and then the whole congregation are going across the river. The whole congregation's doing it. Everybody's doing it. They're all walking across the river. So because that church is doing it, well, we should do it too. So we're all gonna go down after this and we're all gonna the reality is he did it on the bridge. He went across the bridge. He didn't tell me that. He just said he went across the river. But that's who walked on the bridge. Bridge. But Peter didn't do it because everybody else was doing it. He didn't look around and go, oh, there's another bunch of people over there jumping out of a windswept boat. Look at them, they're walking up water. I think, don't give this a crack and try to He didn't do it because everybody else was doing it. Nobody was doing it. There was nobody else out there doing it other than Jesus himself. It wasn't because he was inspired by the latest book at Google. He was inspired. I bought the latest book and I read, I'm so inspired. By the latest book. That's why I'm going to go again. There's a guy who walked on water once, he wrote a book. He said, he's, he's the one who built this five steps, guaranteed, sealed, delivered, signed up, and you these five steps, you are going to walk on water, and I'm so inspired by that book that I've gone out there, and I'm going to jump out of the boat, I'm going to walk on the water because the guy from Pure Army wrote the book, he said to do it. Well, my favorite preacher, my favorite podcast, he said, to it. so I'm going to do it because he did it once, I'm going to do it. I remember when I first became a Christian. I'm not going to say the name of the book, I'm not going to say the name of the author. But I'm just going to say this. I read a book about the Holy Spirit. And this gentleman talked about his experience with the Holy Spirit. And now he would come home from school and he would lock himself in his bedroom and he would just have like eight hours of the Holy Spirit talking to him. And, and, and all these experiences he talked about. Oh man, I was so hungry for God that I thought that was normal. And so I remember uh, uh, coming home uh, after work and just uh, locking myself in my room and just sitting there for like hours and hours and hours and hours just waiting for God to do for me what he did for this guy. And there was a massive disconnect between our experiences. I generally tended to get bored, fall asleep, uh, maybe got the engagement, a little goosebump, I don't know if that was strong. Uh, but it wasn't exactly the way that he said it. Sometimes we can read other people's stories and we can, we can get inspired. I mean, it's a big word at the moment, isn't it? Especially during the Olympics. Every single interview I've seen of every Australian athlete, the, the interviewer goes, I don't know what the result was there, but, yeah, but I just want you to know, how do you, how do you feel knowing you've inspired millions of athletes? 
You know, you, you know what I find funny about inspiration? Inspiration lasts a couple of weeks, doesn't it? How many of you have ever been inspired by... by I'm, I'm inspired by the biggest loser came out. Everyone was inspired to lose weight and to go out and exercise. And it lasted a few weeks. Then people went back to their normal eating routines and so on. We can hear a great message. We get inspired about prayer. And maybe we pray for two weeks, maybe three. But then at the end of it, we're back to where we started. Apparently, inspiration is just not enough to bring about change. I'm not saying inspiration is wrong, but I'm saying there's more to it. We need more than inspiration to get out of the bucket. And the walk on water. Peter didn't get out because he was inspired. You know, I often think about that with, with some of them. We've messaged him. I listen to lots of preachers and I love listening right across the spectrum of bullets. I, I love uh, uh, keeping a, 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 a broad sort of base of, of input who I'm hearing from. And one thing I've recognised is that, 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 that from a preaching perspective, it doesn't matter whether it sounds good on Sunday, it just doesn't work on Monday. It might sound good on Sunday, and you might be amen and throwing your hats in the air and Theo could be up on the chair doing these ones. Uh, but, but you know what? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's maybe it would be, uh, the honor, maybe it would want him to. Uh, but it doesn't matter necessarily whether it sounds good on Sunday. The only question is is it going to work on Monday? Is it going to work on Monday? So inspiration sounds really good on Sunday, but sometimes it doesn't translate and it doesn't work on Monday. Or maybe it will for the first Monday, but by the second Monday, he's gone. By the third Monday, it's completely gone. Peter didn't walk on water because he was inspired. It wasn't because his favourite preacher did it once. He didn't do it because that's what I've always done. Uh, and we've always done it like that, we've always walked on water. We go back to Matthew chapter 8, Peter's in another storm, in another boat, and this time he doesn't get out of the boat and walk on water. In fact, him and the rest of his buddies wake Jesus up because Jesus is actually asleep. It says he's asleep on a pillow. They wake Jesus up and excuse him, don't you care about us anymore? Don't you care? So he didn't get out of the boat and walk last time. This time he sat down and woke Jesus up and he accused God of not caring about him. So it wasn't that it was something he'd done before. He didn't do it because this is what I've always done. Every time I get into a storm, I must get out of the boat. That's not what he did. And it wasn't because he was a follower of Jesus. There were 11 other guys in that boat who never got out. There were 11 other guys who didn't walk on water that day. There were 11 other guys who just stood in the boat, observed and watched. So what was it that got an intelligent fisherman like Peter to do something that he knew he couldn't do? Well, again, it's very simple. He had a word to do it. He had a word to do it. Peter wasn't technically walking on water. I guess you could say he was walking on the word of God. He was walking on the word. Now what's interesting is that Peter actually had the, the gall to ask Jesus to give him that word. But he got it. The others didn't even have the call to ask. Oh, I wonder whether 10 couldn't have walked that way. I wonder whether all 12 couldn't. There was something in Peter that wanted that word from God. And so he asked Jesus, if that's you, show me to come on out and I'll come on out. So technically, Peter's walking on a word from God. The word is meant to be lived, not just liked. The word of God is meant to be stood on. It's not meant to be just simply studied meant to make a difference in our world. Peter knew in that moment that he had Jesus' permission to walk on water. But Jesus didn't invite him to do it so that he knew he had an invitation. The goal was that he'd actually do it. That he'd actually do it. So God's word is an invitation to enter into a transformative experience with Jesus. Every time we step out on the water of God's word, every time we do something the way that we know God wants us to do it, and then we have an experience. Every time we step out in faith and we handle the situation the way we know God wants us to handle it, we have an experience where God gets involved in that place, in that situation, in that circumstance, in that thing. And that's the way that we get transformed. We hear the word of God, we know what God says about something, and we do it. When we do it, the Holy Spirit floods into that space and we have an experience with God. I have people all the time saying, I want to have an encounter with God. So you know what I say? Have an encounter with God first. Have an encounter. People sitting there going, I want to have an encounter with God. Well, encounter His Word. Get into His Word and with God. I want an experience with God. I say, well, go and have an experience with His Word. Because if you have an experience with His Word, you'll have an experience with God. 
But it's not enough just to know what the Word of God says. It's not enough just to know information. Jesus never came to give us a picture of information. Jesus didn't come. Matthew 4, 19 is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Oh, I'm very much against formulas. You know, some people say there's formulas for this and formulas for that. Everything's formulas. Like seven steps to prosperity. Anyone that have got that book yet? I did the seven steps, so it's still four. I can't work it out. I had a six divine so I shouldn't say it, not four. But you know what I mean. I didn't get the end result. Um, you know, there are three steps to divine healing. If you just do one, two, three, everybody gets healed. I've tried the three steps, I've still got some problems going on in my body. So either there's something wrong with me, or there's something wrong with the formula. When we were in one week, it was really, really funny. Years ago, there was this period where everybody started falling pregnant. Do you remember that? Everybody started getting pregnant, all the ladies. And there was a thing called the Billings Method. Anyone ever heard of the Billings Method? I'm not judging the Billings Method. I'm not anti-Billings Method. Let me clarify on that. But they were all on the Billings Method. What happened was every single one of them, the one with the Billings Method, all got pregnant. Now, the Billings Method was a form of contraception to stop them getting pregnant, but they all got pregnant. But you know what they would do? They would take responsibility on themselves, and they would defend the method and say, I know it's good, Bruce. must have been me. It's a bit like, hang on a second. What if, what if there's a chink in the armour of the method? What if it's not an exact science and a perfect formula? Like the seven steps to prosperity. Or the three ways to divine healing. What if they're not exact formulas? I don't think God has given us a bunch of formulas. I don't think Jesus came down to give us formulas. But if I could find a formula, Matthew 4, 19 is the only formula I can find. That's where Jesus says this, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You've got one part of play, follow me. Just follow me. Would you just commit to following me? He didn't say study me. Study me and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say understand me and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say work me out. He said, hey, here's what I want you to do. The starting point is this. Just commit your life to follow. I'm here now. You're there now. Follow means movement. I'm going to start taking steps. And you boys, I want you to drop what you're doing. And I want you to take steps with me. And as you start to take steps with me, you'll start to have experience encounter. You'll start to understand me. But the goal is not just to understand it. I just want you to start taking some steps with me. And as you start to take steps with me, things will begin to happen in your life. Some people sitting back, study, 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 and, and, and no, no, no. We've got all this knowledge about God, but we're still empty and frustrated. We still lack all the promises of God. We don't experience the promises of God. We don't see the results that God's Word said we can get if we follow after Him. But we're frustrated and we think, but God, I know everything, and that's probably part of the problem. It was never about knowing everything. It was about doing. It's about doing what Jesus calls us to do. God wanted Peter to experience what it was like to walk on the water, not just know that he said he could. Give it to you, Jesus. Tell me to come. Come. Awesome. And he stays in the boat and tells everybody, guess what? Jesus said, I will walk on the water. You do it. Get out of the boat and experience it. Do it. Do what he's calling you to do. We're not told to pray so we can know it. That we're allowed to pray, but we're told to pray, so that we'll actually pray. We're, we're not told to forgive those that hurt us and offend. We're not told to forgive them, just so that we know it's an option there from God. That's an option. That means you really want it. I'm just letting you know, if you want to forgive them, you forgive them. It's an option. Another option. Now, God wants us to forgive, because when we forgive, there's a transaction that takes place. And we actually experience God in the doing of His Word, not just in the knowing of His Word. We're told to give of our time, of our energy. Yes, even our finances. We're told to be generous. Not just so we know it's an option. No, it's an option if you want it. There's one option. The other option, don't buy cheap food. It's an option. Don't buy anything. It's an option. There's plenty of options out there. But when God's going, I want you to not just know that this is an option. But we do. The goal is that you would do it. And in the doing, you will experience the transformation that I want to bring into your world. It's why the doing, it's why the getting actually out of the boat, not just knowing you can get out of the boat, but actually taking the practical steps to take a foot out over it and get out of the boat. This is why so many people who sit in church their whole life have never experienced transformation and change because they don't want to take the first frightening step out of the boat. I want you to tell me how to fix this problem. I want you to tell me what God's Word says. Counsel me, lead me. I'm even praying, Holy Spirit, give me the next step, tell me what to do, and we get all the information, but we don't want to take the first step because it's frightening something. It's frightening sometimes. I remember when I first started giving finances, like tithing and offerings, it was frightening for me. I've got to tell you, I was not brought up in a land of plenty. 
I was not brought up in a land of plenty. We didn't have a lot growing up. And, and the mentality, and my, I love my father, he's a great man and, and, and a great relationship, but it was the way he was brought up, was that if you have something, hang on to it as long as you possibly can, because you don't know when the next lot's going to come in. So you just hold on to it like this, and you don't, you're not generous, you don't give, it was funny, my dad would give the shirt off his back to people. But somewhere down the translation, that was our life, was you hold it, because you just don't know when the next paycheck's going to come in. You just don't know when the next uh, thing's going to happen. So if you've got something, you hold it as long as you can. So the thought of opening my hand and then generously giving and then putting myself in a place, but now I've got to trust God. Well, hang on a second, I thought I had covered That's probably part of the problem. I have done it. I'm still working out of my own strength, my own ideas. But all of a sudden, I give, become generous, and now I put myself in a place where I begin to experience God. I begin to allow God to come into some of those places. We're not told to be saved just so we know it's an option. You know, it's an option. You must be born again. Well, it's a great option, Jesus. I'll keep that one in mind. I'll see how all the others work out for us. Now, if, if, I want, if, if, you, if you step across that threshold, if you give your life to me, if you'll make that choice to surrender control and start following me, you don't have to understand it all, you don't have to have it all worked out, you don't have to know how it all, everything sort of goes like we do today. We're obsessed with knowledge. We've got to know everything about everything. If you press a button, how does the microwave work? It happens, speaks, and this happens, and that. We put a man on the moon, bring a man back, we go to Mars. We've just got so much knowledge about everything. But when it comes to God, it's kind of the same. We can go book to book, podcast to podcast, but the real action, the real power is found not in the knowing, it's always been found in the doing of God's word. Always been found when we step out in faith. Martin Luther King said this once. He said, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm just going to do what I know God wants me to do. I'm going to be like Peter. I know the word of God, and I'm going to step out of the boat, and I'm going to step onto the word of his work, and I'm going to begin to work. And sometimes things will work out fantastic. Sometimes things might not, but I'm still going to do it, because it's in the doing that transformation comes, change takes place. I remember... First time I had this, uh, a really, from my heart, embraced God's, God's invitation to forgive. And I had a, uh, I love my mother, but I had a rough relationship with my mother growing up. It wasn't very good. And I remember uh, sitting in a, a classroom on a, a Y-Wing training school and the Holy Spirit saying to me, forgiveness is a choice, Alma. It's not a feeling. It starts with a choice. Choose to do the right thing. Feelings will follow later. If you sit there waiting for your feelings to feel like an album with your background of what's going on, you will never forgive that one. Because the feelings are so real. And I remember sitting there wrestling with this, thinking, but God, you don't understand. And what well, that's a great thing to say to God. You don't understand, God. Prayer of heaven, earth, you just don't get it. Jehovah! I remember sitting there and wrote a letter to my mother and, and you know what I did? I took ownership of me. I said, Mum, here's the deal. I want to say to you that I did and I listed these things that I've done that I wish you wasn't aware of. I said, Mum, I want to ask you for this, for being not a great son. Instead of, I, I, I looked at myself and I, and I said, you know what? Two weeks, because this is back before you know, when you press the button you know, it comes back to you in 30 seconds, you know? This was back when we used to have these things called letters. Remember the letters? Put them in an envelope, put them in a paper, put them in a stamp, and then sort of send it off. See how it's taken, he said. Remember Slack? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I remember I sent that off two weeks later, I gave a letter back to my mother. And I opened up that letter, and you know what I honestly thought, you know, because this is the formula, this is the way it's going to happen. Mum's going to say this letter, Alan, you were actually a perfect child, it wasn't you, it was me. And I was ready for it, I was pumped. I knew that's what the letter was going to say. I opened up that letter and I quickly whip it open and, 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 and inside that letter. And I, by the way, I even sent my mother 50 bucks because I used to steal money when I was a kid. And so I put 50 bucks in the letter and sent She didn't know that. I said, this is, I, I definitely, I got better in the bargain here, but here's 50 back, you know. And I gave it back to her, I confessed what I used to do. She wants this letter back to me. And you know what she says? Yeah, you were a bit of a, well, I was a child, weren't you? That's okay. And I'm thinking, what? All of a sudden, all those nice feelings of forgiveness that have built up inside me that caused me to write the letter, they disappeared and I was angry again and frustrated. And going, no, 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 no. Forgiveness is a choice. I choose. choose to let it go. I didn't necessarily get the result that was in the brochure, the result that I thought, but I hadn't counted God in that moment and I learned so much about forgiveness through just taking a step of faith. 
one step in the direction of whatever it is that the Word of God is saying to you about your situation or your circumstances in life. When we got saved, how many of you knew as much about Jesus on that day you gave your life to Him as you do now? Most of us didn't, did we? we? We might have thought we did. We might have thought we had this Jesus thing worked out, but then we come into an actual relationship with him by taking that initial step of faith, by going, it's not enough just to know I should be born again, I'm going to get born again. Not enough just to know I should repent, I'm going to repent. Not enough to just know I should put my faith in him, I'm actually going to put my faith in him. And when we do, it's like that initial first step. We step into something and we begin to have experience again, we begin to learn about God, we begin to grow in our faith, maturity starts to come, but nothing happened until you took that first step. Step of faith. Somewhere along the line, I feel like we get so overwhelmed with knowledge that we, we, we almost get paralyzed to a point where we go, Ooh, I don't know what to do now because I've got so much knowledge about God. So much information. You know what you need to do? What is God saying to you? What is the Word of God saying to you about your situation right now? What are you facing? Um, uh, Luke chapter 6 is one of my favourite uh, stories that Jesus shared. It's a very simple one again. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49, the wise and foolish builder. And here's how it goes. Jesus starts by saying this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? What a fascinating question. Isn't that a great question? Jesus begins to tell a story about two, these two guys who built these houses, one on sand, one on rock. But he starts it by saying this. Let me first ask you a question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do anything I say. The word Lord is an interesting word. It's curious. It's not only Nick's last name. Did you know that? It's not only Nick's last name. Curious. And, and it literally means the one to whom I belong. He's saying, Why are you saying that I belong to you, but you don't do anything I say? In other words, if you're not doing anything I say, how can you actually say, I belong to you? And then he goes on and he shares the story of these two guys. He says, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. Who's hearing the sayings of God this morning? Nobody here. Gee, I must be preaching out of the morning. <laughs> Does anybody here feel like they're hearing the sayings of Jesus? We're talking out of yet? Okay. So here's the thing. He says, whoever hears my sayings and what? Does them. So in other words, whoever hears them and then walks away and not goes, I'm going to just do mental gymnastics out of that one and then give a scorecard out of ten at the end of the day. That was an eight. That was a three. It, you know, wasn't inspiring enough. Wasn't this? No, no, no. He went and hears them and goes, okay, what are you saying to me? What do I take out of this? What, what step of faith do I take? What, what change of direction, course of action? What's going to come out of this for me today? And he says, whoever hears them and does, put the two together, hearing and doing, he says, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid a foundation on the rock, and when the floods arose, he didn't say if the floods arose. How many of you have a fire rise against you in life? Who's had floods come against them? Jesus, he doesn't hide the truth of life with him, does he? He never once says you'll never be persecuted, you'll never have rejection, you'll never have a hard time, it's going to be a bed of roses, you don't know what, this is going to be great, it's going to be cake and cream and cookies, it's going to be the best time of your life, come follow me! He never says that. He says he's going to reject with me, guess what? You're going to get rejected. I'm sorry, I'm not saying it's a great idea, I'm not saying you're going to love it, but I'm not going to hide the truth from you. If you're going to follow me, you will face rejection. If you're going to follow me, you will be persecuted. If you're going to follow me, you will be misunderstood. If you're going to follow me, you're going to be alienated at times. If you're going to follow me, there will be some environments where you just don't fit. If you're going to follow me, this is what life's going to look like. Everything you give up, everything you lay down, the exchange is so much better. I'm here to give, I want to give you something so that at the end of the day, you're the one holding the exchange. And that was worth every moment of it. Because I've got something so much better for you. But I want you to lay down that. I want you to pick up this. And I want you to do what I say. Because I promise you, life will be better if you do what I say. This is the promise of God. You don't have to say if the storms come, when they come, they're going to come. You are either just come through a storm, or you're about to go into a storm, or you are in a storm. That's the way life works. Anyone work that out? I used to think if I just get over this hill, everything's going to be beautiful. I'll praise God, worship God, there'll be peace, the sun will shine, me and God will be one. And I get over the top of the mountain, and then I look and bang, there's a valley on the other side. It's like, no! I just want to get to the mountain. Is there one of those trolley swing things? I just want to go from mountain top to mountain top, and to get to the next mountain, I want to walk through the valley. I don't want valleys. I don't want storms. I don't want them. I don't want them. But apparently, apparently, you can survive storms with peace. Matthew chapter 8, where, where 
way Jesus said to the song is to clean that up. May wake him up. Don't you care about us? When he gets up and of course he comes to storm. That's awesome. God, he can do that. But then Jesus turns to him and he says, who's your friend? What he's really saying is this, that, that, that you guys are waking me up. The miracle is not me coming to storm. If God is God, coming to storm. Seriously. I mean, if you really believe Genesis 1, coming to storm, come on. Huh? That's a simple one, isn't it? That's easy. The real miracle is that there was a man on that boat, asleep, who's going to kill while the storm was raging. He can sleep through storms, you can still have peace through some of the difficulties and hard times of life. And that's the miracle. When I see somebody that's going through a storm, the floods are coming and so on, but they're standing on the word of God. They're standing on what God says. They're not shifting. They're not swaying. They're not allowing circumstances to dictate their obedience to the word of God. They're going, I don't care about that because I'm committed to following Jesus. That's what I'm committed to. And I'm going to stand on his word. I'm going to walk on his word even in the midst of the roughest storm. I'm going to maintain peace. I'm going to maintain my composure. Because I'm going to keep walking on the word of God. It's possible. That's the miracle. Jesus sleeping in the boat. That's a way to be a miracle when he comes. Way to be a miracle. It says he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation. When the floods arose, the storm beat vehemently against that house. He couldn't shake it. It was founded on the rock. But watch this. But he who heard, anyone here hearing the word of God? Yep. Heard and then did nothing. So hang on a second. So Jesus is actually standing at a rise on Sunday morning. He's standing at a rise on Sunday morning and he's preaching with his sister. Everybody's hearing it. Some are going to do it. Some are going to do nothing. We're all going to face the storms. We're all going to face the pressure. It's going to come against us. But watch this. He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on earth without a foundation. They both heard it. And they both went and built a house. Both of them. They both built it away. They both created life for themselves. The difference is, one of them is creating his life based on doing what Jesus said. The other is building his life based on doing nothing as Jesus said. Maybe just doing what culture says is popular. Maybe doing what felt most convenient. Maybe doing what kept him out of trouble. Maybe, who knows. But he says, this guy built his house. When the storms came and the stream beat vehemently, Immediately it fell. The root of the house was broken. Seems to be a lot better fruit for the guy that heard the word of Jesus and did. I want the fruit of the man that heard and the fruit of the man that did. No matter how tough it is, no matter how hard it is. Let me give you three scenarios. What would you think of your children? If they knew the wrong thing, you they did it anyway. We call that disobedient. We say that's disobedient. You know it's the wrong thing to do, and you're doing it. So we would call that disobedient. What about scenario number two? They knew the right thing to do, and they didn't. What would we call that child? Obedient. We would say that child is an obedient child. Let me throw a third scenario at you. What if they knew the right thing to do, but didn't, even though they weren't doing the wrong thing? They were doing the wrong thing. They were doing the right thing, either. It doesn't seem as bad, does it? But at the end of the day, maybe they're still being disobedient. They're actually not doing what you've asked them to do. Perhaps you clean your room. You're in the room playing the PlayStation. Perhaps you clean your room. <laughs> okay, now playing the PlayStation is not morally wrong. I'm not destroying anything or hurting anybody. But I've asked you to clean your room. I would look at that and go, that tilts me more towards the disobedient side than it does the obedient side. You know what? I wonder whether that's where a lot of Christianity sits. We're not doing the wrong things. We're staying away from the drugs and sex and the and, and promiscuity. We're staying away from the, 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 the beating people up. We're not stealing cars. We're not smashing people's homes. We're not stealing handbags off old ladies in the streets. We don't swear. And we don't think we don't. And we're keeping away from all that stuff. We're not doing any of that bad stuff. But we don't pray. We don't forgive. We're not generous. We don't seek. We don't do that. But it doesn't matter. Don't do that. Look at all the things we should be doing. We're not doing any of that. I wonder sometimes whether that's the mentality that some believers carry into their faith. Jesus made it simple with his two-point formula. If you'll just follow me, follow me. If I'll take care of the rest, I'll make you official in me. I will transform you. I will change you. I will do, I will work with you. 
you'll become what I want you to become. But it's, it's inherent. I'm not even understanding of it. I just want you to follow. Start just by following me. And I'll lead you. And I'll change you. And I'll take you to the place that I want you to be. You see, we're not called to say Jesus is the Lord. We're called to display Jesus as the Lord. My life should be displaying that Jesus is the Lord. I shouldn't need to say that Jesus is the Lord. I don't think more there that I want to get into, but I don't want to do it now. Can I get a band to come back? I want to finish with that song, The Goodness of God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. You know, we don't always understand what God says, but we're still called to do what God says. Amen? I mean, God gave us a heads up. He told us right there in Proverbs. He said, trust in me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, because some of the things I'm going to tell you to do, they're going to be wacky. Some of the things I'm going to tell you to do will be countercultural. Some of the things I'm going to tell you to do, they're not going to be part of your background, part of your upbringing. Some of the things I'm going to tell you to do, they're not going to make a lot of intellectual sense. But if you'll just go with me, if you'll just trust me, then I'll, I'll, you'll have an experience with God, an encounter with God, an opportunity for transformation and change. Forgiving somebody that hurt you doesn't make sense. To my natural understanding, that's not how I do it. You punch me, I want to punch you twice. And harder. You want to put me down, I want to assert my governance over you and squash your feet. Just be honest, that's the natural human tendency. It doesn't make sense to me to hear in the midst of a pandemic. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's interesting, the last few weeks I've felt like God's been speaking to me uh, 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 about this season of life, and I, I feel like I have been giving more in the last few weeks. I don't know why. I'm not rich, I'm not getting I'm at, but here's what I do know is that as I follow him, that's what he's saying to me. That's what he's saying to me. So I'll just keep following him and I'll just keep doing it. But within my brain it makes no sense. I might say around cut this is ridiculous God. Come on. It doesn't make sense to me. I've got a choice, well then I might understand him. Or in all my ways acknowledge him. That word acknowledge in the Hebrew yard means have a deep intimate contact with him. In all your ways have intimate contact with God. Don't think in your own understanding. Some things that God calls us to do is ludicrous. Imagine being Joshua. March around the wall seven times and the end goes, ah! The wall's going to fall. That makes sense. Go and wash your dirty spirit. You can heal the legacy. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Son of God, he's the Lord of the universe. All the energy of angels. He gives himself up for the life of you and me. Lean not on our own understanding. All your ways of knowledge. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm sorry, but you told us that from Alan. The way I think Alan is not what he thinks. I think you'll have different to you. Nor my way is your ways, Alan. Says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. I am in your ways, Alan. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, Alan. I'm not called to understand anything God says, but I am called to do it. The transformation and change takes place. What I actually do, what God's called me to I wonder how many opportunities for growth and transformation, how many answers to prayer are we missing out on? Because we're not doing our part in obedience and faith and stepping out. Doing what God said to do. Years ago, we were on the guitar. We started playing guitar in the moment, and nobody else could play a week of music. So, we going to India, and no one knew how to play music, so we were prepared to learn to do the worship. Practicing guitar, we were doing the guitar, and one day, he got spoke to me, he said, I'm going to do the guitar, I'm going to do the guitar, and he gave it to me to practice with, and then the Lord spoke to me one day. And it's certainly not when really you mind us. He said this to me, so I want you to ask him to pray like you need his guitar. That's what I did. <laughs> that uncomfortable <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Anything he Jesus, but that. Anyway, 
couple of months went by, and I did nothing. And one day in a prayer meeting, God the Holy Spirit said, You know, I'm going to pray for something, you want something to happen. I'll give you a step to take. So I walked up to this guy, way older than me, much more mature than me, and said, I know this is going to seem funny, but I just feel like a couple of months ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and asked me to ask you, would you pray for me? He went, oh, I forgot, two months ago the Lord spoke to me and said I was going to give you my guitar. <laughs> still have that guitar if I didn't take one step of faith and actually do what I felt like the Lord was saying. Now I'm not saying let's get up from here and don't ask everybody for their cars, get up and let yourself go. None of that stuff. What I'm saying is this, the point is this, that how many answers to prayer are going on there? How many opportunities are we missing? Because we're missing that vital ingredient, the most vital ingredient of actually doing the word. James says, be doers of the word, not here as only if you're here at home, you are so not about that. It's about putting legs in action with faith to the Word of God and stepping out of the Bible. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for the opportunity to gather here today, God. This is a great opportunity. Oh, there's, there's many people in the state in lockdown. God, there are nations around the world that they would give their right arm for this prayer God. And we've got it, Father. We are grateful and thank you for it, Lord. And God, I thank you for your Word. The Word is good. Father, we sing about the goodness of God. One of the good things you've done for us is you've given us your word. You've given us a love in that form. And Father, I just pray for every person in this room this morning. God, I pray that next time we open up the pages of your word, the next time we sit down and pray and wait on you, that Father, we wouldn't do it with, a, with an attitude that just wants to gather more information. God, we would do it with a, a sense that what you're going to say to us right now is a call to action. It's a call to do something. God, so that we can actually make a difference. God, there, there are people out there right now that are hearing words and they're doing something with it. And they're not hearing your word, God. They're hearing other words. And they're stepping out and they're putting legs to it. And they're hearing that word as a call to action. And they're changing society. And I feel like we have the same invitation. And we've got to do something. So God, I just pray that you would empower us, embolden us, God, for whatever's got to happen in each person's heart in this room. That we take those bold steps of faith. Even now, Holy Spirit, I pray, speak to people in this room. What is the thing that you told them to do with that? No. What's that last thing you spoke to them? What's that, what's that prompting? What does the Word of God say about that situation? Well, I pray with you, Holy Spirit, I like that to people right now. Speak to their hearts. As they get up and leave this place, they will have a, an action step. I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go and do this. This is what I'm going to say. And I'm just going to trust in faith results. I'll leave the results to God. I'll just play my part for them. Let Lord make it. So, Father, thank you. We love you. We thank you for the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Pray all this in your precious name. Amen.